Professor Ignatyev, dear participants, excellencies, ambassadors, former members of the VAR, colleagues, beste dames en heren, ladies and gentlemen, I continue in English. Welcome to today's VAR lecture with the theme Open Society, its old enemies and its new friends. I'm very pleased you've come. Of course, pleased given our prominent guest, Michael Ignatyev, President and Rector of the Central University, European University in Budapest. Pleased also given the other distinguished guests and speakers that will reflect on today's theme. But I'm also pleased you've come because today's theme is an urgent one and a crucial one. It requires us all to think, reflect, but also act and take responsibility. In other words, today's theme requires you to be more than just an observer, just a listener, just an audience. You're an actor as well. In making up today's audience, and in taking responsibility tomorrow. For I say nothing new with the observation that we're living in a time of complex and profound changes, an ever-expanding globalization, the ongoing move of immigrants to Western societies, the opportunities but also risks of a world connected by digital means, and of course, democratic values at stake in countries that are part, even part, of the European Union. These and other changes clearly have an effect on core values that underlie what has been described by Karl Popper in his book, Open Societies, the 1945 book. In that book, Popper contrasted open societies with closed ones. Closed societies leave no room for voice and have closed borders, closed borders in various interpretations of that word. An open society, in contrast, is one that encourages rational reflection, gives individuals the freedom and responsibility th to think for themselves. It is based, above all, on democracy, equality, and faith in reason. Today, Mikhail Ignatyev takes us in his lecture to the many dilemmas that we face in our current day society in upholding these core values that underlie an open society. Inspired, I'm sure, by his observations, today's columnist Harun Sheik and the panel members, which will be introduced to you later, will reflect on the role of media, academia, and civil society in maintaining openness and democracy. And finally, my colleague, Ernst Balin, Council Member of the VAR, will bring together the insights that we've gained and relate them to the VAR. Different from earlier years, the panel will not be moderated by a member of the Council. For we find it crucial, in particular given the theme of today, that all generations participate in the discussion of the open society. Hence, we invited all Dutch universities to name one student to act as a moderator. And we are highly pleased to have Lydia Vlachsma, student at the, at the Radboud University, Nijmegen, in our midst to moderate the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, turning a blind eye to the many changes we face in today's society or simply close our very minds to them is no longer an option. Friends and enemies of the open society are among us, even in the Netherlands. This very week is illustrative with the controversy surrounding Black Piet, Zwarte Piet. As you know, our traditional Dutch celebration of Santa Claus, Sinterklaas, and in particular the character of Black Piet, Zwarte Piet. It testifies of the collusion between open and closed societies the motivations of those who value the traditions that come with this children party, considering its origins, history, and practices. And on the other hand, the motivations of those that claim that Black Pete is racist. Whatever perspective you take, an open society allows for a debate between these two perspectives. A closed society is a society where people erect a roadblock as individuals did last week in the northern part of our country. A 
and thus preventing people from freely articulating their perspective in the debate. And that is illustrative for an attack on the virtues of an open society. A closed society is a society where the state does not act upon such a violation, the right to demonstrate. Hence, it's not difficult to point to clashes close by. And we can all think of other examples that point to various other clashes. And thus, we can no longer downplay the significance of phenomena and their relation to the open society. We cannot downplay the need for friends, perhaps even new friends, in upholding core values of an open society and the role and responsibility of various actors, ranging from media, academia, civil society, and the state. Ladies and gentlemen, I do hope we offer you an inspiring afternoon for further reflection of this complex challenge. And before giving the floor to our keynote speaker, Michael Ignatieff, two final points. I truly regret to say that the Vice Chancellor of the Free University Amsterdam is not able to participate in our panel discussion. And he wanted me to say to you um, that he very much regrets that. And he also wanted me to explain to you the reason. His wife is really seriously ill and he had to stay with his wife this afternoon. Um, and we decided that I then take not so much the role of the Vice Chancellor of the Free University, I cannot, but I switch hats. Uh, for I'm an academic as well, I'm a professor at Tilburg University, uh, former Dean of the Law School, and thus I participate in the panel with that cap and uh, represent academia in the panel discussion. So I'm not the chair at that point in the program of the VAR. And before, as said, giving Michael Ignatieff the floor, one more thing. Given the size of today's audience, you all, it's not possible for us to have you all participate in the discussion. Nevertheless, new media provide us with a tool that at least allows you to be a bit more than just a silent audience. Hence, we have two questions, and that's why the mini smart meter type of thing is on the background and why you've been given the small card because we would like you to answer two questions. First, I would like you to introduce yourself. Um, as you see, question one, with what domain do you, and I have it in front of me here, with what domain do you have the strongest affinity? Just to give us, to give us all a bit of a feeling what type of audience we are here today. So society, yes, of course, we're all society. But perhaps the uh, strongest, strongest feeling in politics media. No, no more than just five. In media, science, academia, 27. OK. We have an audience of around uh, 200, so Many more to go, but nevertheless, um, I think this is it more or less for now. Yeah, it gives us a bit of a feeling. Um, then the next question. I just referred, referred, sorry, I just referred to core values that you could relate to the term open society. And I referred to democracy, equality, faith in reason. My second question is, what is the very first term that you would like to link with the theme of today, open society? And the combination of all these terms makes up a word cloud. And just to warn you, we repeat this question uh, at the end of the program, just to see whether your first word related to open society is a different word now than it is at the end of the program. And in the meantime, I'm sure, no, the question is not yet there. Um, can someone from Technics change? Oh, it's there, okay. What first 
What word first comes up in thinking about the open society? Please use your phone. And after that, please switch off your phone uh, to turn it on later on, as said. So freedom, an important one. Democracy, Dutch words as well there. Um, don't necessarily use, need to use English words, you can use Dutch words as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is a wonderful cloud for now. Thank you for sharing it with us. I think it's time to invite our keynote speaker, our lecturer, to come to the floor. Professor Ignatieff, may I ask you to come to the stage? Thanks so much. It's a great uh, honor to be here. I was looking at the list of all the distinguished people in the audience and thought, well, for two hours, the Dutch government's going to come to a complete standstill here. So <laughs> I'm very flattered that you're here, and I thank you very much. Um, I was dropped off this morning uh, at the door of WRR by a, a driver, and as I got out, he said, those are the smartest people in the Netherlands. So I thought that was good. Um, I hope it's true. Uh, but it's very nice to be invited by WRR. I thank you very much for the invitation. And as for the word cloud, I, I was kind of hoping I was rooting for love in the uh, list of words, but it seems to have been crowded out by freedom in the word cloud. So there you go. Anyway, um, let me try and talk to you a little bit about what I wanted to do in the next uh, half an hour. Um, WRR deals in important public policy issues. I think I'll be talking about narrative, the shape, the story we want to tell about the world we're in on the basis of the ideal of the open society as it came to be crafted in 1945 in Karl Popper's work. It's a synonym for liberal democracy in a way, but open society is a more specific de definition of, of liberal democracy. So essentially, I'm trying to talk to you about a narrative of what, what's happened to liberal democracy since 1945, um, and then raise some questions about the problems it currently uh, faces. If you think about what the ideal of an open society is, you, you kind of come with four ideas, it seems to me. The first claim is an epistemological one. Closed societies define the truth of their people. Open societies leave the determination of truth to a free process of scientific falsification. The distinctive feature of Popper's version of liberal democracy is that it put its emphasis on the epistemological basis of what we do. We allow uh, free deliberation to determine uh, public policy and, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and democratic choice. And the epistemological claim is clearly in trouble because we're in this thing called the post-truth society. So the epistemological foundations of liberal democracy are challenged as never before. I think the second aspect of open society is, is a political claim, which is that closed societies favor mass coercion single-party domination. Open societies privilege a politics that Popper called piecemeal social engineering. And the miracle that is Western liberal prosperity since 1945 is the result of piecemeal social engineering, by which I mean learning from your mistakes. God knows we've made mistakes getting to the Netherlands of 2017, but we got there with piecemeal social engineering massive public debate, resistance argument, and incrementally we produce this enormous edifice of, of wealth. But that piecemeal social engineering leaves people enormously discontented. Where is the vision? Where, are the, where, where, where is the radiant tomorrow? Where is the bright horizon? I'm a big fan being an old-style liberal of piecemeal social engineering, but let's not neglect the discontent it leaves behind. 
the, se- the third claim I think about open society is a moral claim, which is liberal societies are societies that care about individuals' retail. Individuals matter. We talk a lot about diversity and difference, but the difference that we care about morally is the difference between each of you in the room. Um, and that the value we give to individuals is essentially the moral claim that sus- sustains liberal democracy. The final claim is a historical claim. One of the things that open societies and liberal democracy have said for themselves with particular confidence in the 70s and 80s was that in the long run, open societies would prevail over closed ones. That is, there was a a tacit historical narrative in the post-45 world that open societies would eventually win out. And if I think there's one thing that's got us troubled in 2017, it's suddenly a doubt particularly posed by China and other closed societies, as to whether that historical narrative uh, remains true. So those are the claims that essentially undergird a liberal society, epistemological, political, moral, and historical. But there's another thing that, another thing we need, I think, to say, which is open society itself has changed enormously since 1945. The the open society that Karl Popper took for granted in 1945 when he was writing is unimaginable or unrecognizable to us now. It was a society of rationing, exchange controls, nationalized industries, confiscatory rates of taxation, mobilization for reconstruction, strongly national cultures, strongly monoethnic societies, and held together by, on the one hand, the memory of fascism and the totalitarian threat in the future. And that's a very different um, a situation for open societies. Now we look at a very different open society with free movement of capital, hyper-migration, hyper-connectivity, hyper-diversity, a state that is in some sense, thanks to the neoliberal re- revolution, less strong and interventionist than it was in 1945, much higher levels of inequality in 2017 than were take, than than the than the wartime mobilizations uh, in the 1940s. Much more oligopoly. Uh, open societies trying to find their bearings and their cultural space in a globalized culture. And this convulsion of change, I think, has produced within open society a deep nostalgia or the open society of the past, which was in fact a much more closed society than uh, we, we are used to now. If open societies have claimed, it's, it's also the case that closed societies have changed enormously. If you think of the closed society of 1945, it was autarky, socialism in one country, um, sealed frontiers, no exit, no voice, and loyalty based on coercion, to use Albert Hirschman's exit voice and loyalty distinctions. If you flash forward to 2017, our closed societies are unrecognizably different. They've been inserted into the global capitalist economy. They function on what could be called rule by law as opposed to rule of law. Crucially, they they allow exit exit but no voice, and a loyalty based on nationalism. But these are very different than the Soviet communist regimes or the Chinese communist regimes that we faced in the Cold War. And one of the elements that I think is most difficult in thinking about the future of open society is the collusive relationship between open societies in 27 and closed societies. To a degree that we need to that pose the biggest questions in international relations and international security is whether open societies are essentially maintaining closed societies. Think about it for a minute. Um, Chinese, uh, Chinese capitalism allows anybody who's unhappy with the internal party regime to offshore their resources in Vancouver or Amsterdam or London. Um, anybody who is unhappy with Hungary can exit through Schengen. 
These open and closed societies are in a collusive, mutually dependent relationship, which poses huge questions for international relations. Should we buy access markets? Should we buy market access in China in return for allowing, essentially, the stability of single-party rule in China? Have we made our bed with a state capitalist authoritarianism in China? This kind of regime, precisely because it has insertion into the capitalist world, may be much more stable. It may have a much longer future in the 21st century than the closed societies that we thought we'd beaten after 1989. The same dilemma is posed by the liberal democracies in, in Eastern Europe, Hungary and Poland. These societies are parasitic on the openness of, of uh, Western Europe. But Western Europe faces a dilemma. If, you, if they enforce a community of values, if they say Europe has to stand for something, there's a risk that these two societies and many other societies in Easter, Eastern Europe will simply back out of the club. So we have the dilemma of can we bring them back into the fold of genuinely open societies, or is there a risk that when we do so, we precipitate them further on the trajectory of becoming a closed society. Um, so these issues of collusion between open and closed societies are not usually posed, but they, they seem to me to be critical to the future of the international relations of liberal democracies uh, as a whole. Another way to think about the relationship between open and closed societies is the other side of the coin, which is the ways in which closed societies are now directly intervening in our own democracies. Nobody can look at the cyber interference in the election processes in Western Europe and in the United States without having deep alarm at the ways in which closed societies are now intervening and manipulating and trying to shape public opinion in open ones. And this raises questions about how we manage cyberspace and uh, the internet, and whether we can do so consistent with our own valued freedoms. How do we safeguard literally the integrity of our democracies through the 21st century? Seems to me a question we're now fumbling to find answers for. The challenge to open societies don't stop there. Need to say, I hardly need to mention the fact that the vision of an open society is challenged by the border question. Almost everybody, if asked, in our democratic publics, when asked, do you like the idea of an open society, they say, sure, we like an open society, but we'd like closed borders. And so we're living in that contradiction. Um, openness and human rights, a similar conflict. Um, the majoritarian populism we're seeing sweeping through the world is increasingly resistant to international human rights invigilation from the outside. As you know, I come from a perfect country, Canada, a country without blemish. Um, but even we resent external human rights invigilation of some of the domestic problems we have. And that resentment at outside invigilation of open societies grows with every day. And it's not just anymore confined to closed societies. The resentment is very strong in open societies as well. Another conflict, another, I'm raising questions rather than answers. I think I'll have a, the odd answer later on, I hope. Um, one of the other challenge about an open society goes back to the first point I made, which is that these societies have an epistemological basis. We believe in a marketplace of ideas. We believe that facts are stubborn things. Facts are objective. Facts can be found. Why does WRR exist? It exists because it believes there is such a thing as a fact. They do believe that Mr. Ruta, your prime minister, would decide a little better if he decided on the basis of facts. So the rationale of the whole outfit is based on a certain epistemology. And yet, there's no question that the authority of the scientific people in this room is challenged as never before. We all know the Brexit, Mr. Gov's infamous remark about the people being tired of experts. But this is a challenge to professional authority and professional expertise that spreads, that challenges the legitimacy of everybody in this room, including me. 
Um, and it results in a strong kind of anti-empirical majoritarianism in which the test of truth is what a majority believe to be true. And that is a recurrent challenge to democracy in all ages, but I've, I never expected in my lifetime to see that challenge to be as strong, persistent, and angry and ressentiment-filled as it is now. And that must, that must connect to the fact that the professionals who have scientific authority, the professionals who have um, authority based on their expertise, are doing extremely well financially. So resentment epistemologically based resentment is also connected to class resentment in a mixture which is potentially toxic, frankly, for all of us. Um, and there's another challenge as well which relates to what I said earlier about the ways in which closed societies are manipulating our democracy. There's some challenges inside to democracy that we need to think about. You could almost ask whether open society is destroying democracy? That's a provocative question. It can't be true, but there's some element of it that is disturbingly true at the moment. Um, if you look at what the digital revolution has done to democracy, the digital revolution is premised on openness, on frontierless digital communications. But it's having a couple of effects that we're all struggling to, to think about. One of them is what I would call virtual disinhibition. Let me tell you a story from my political life. As you know, I was fantastically successful in politics, so I got an opportunity to lecture you about politics at, at length. Um, uh, but one of the things I noticed in politics is that I shook many thousands of hands in the five years that I had my triumphant political career. And Precisely because it was so triumphant, one of the things I learned is that I never had a disagreeable word with any fellow citizen when I was face to face. Astoundingly, the rules of decorum prevailed in democracy. The internet was something else. It was so awful that my wife said, you're not going to survive if you, if you click on any links referring to you. You'll, you just, you'll curl up and die. So that's an example of what I would call virtual disinhibition, we've unleashed a monster in our politics, which is anonymous comment on the internet. The disinhibiting effect of anonymous comment is producing a kind of rage and hatred and contempt in politics, which used to be disciplined by face -to -face, the face-to-face -face interactions of the democratic agora. And so we're in a new situation. The other component of that, or related phenomenon, I would call algorithmic segregation. You may know it by the term filter bubbles. We're all increasingly prisoners, and we are as much prisoners as anybody else, of the bubbles of information within which we work. And the public space in which we make common decisions and share common factual bases for argument and policy determination is fragmenting. And one of the ways that I think, one of the things we need as policy professionals to avoid is the thought that we are not in a filter bubble. It's those poor other people who are. Folks, let's wake up. We're all in a filter bubble. My filter bubble just happens to have the New York Times in it. But let's not assume, or you have you know, the Volksrand or whatever it is. We're all in filter bubbles. And, and this is reducing our capacity for shared, the, the, the rough shared experience, the rough sense of common fate on which a democratic politics uh, uh, depends. All of this has been accompanied, as I said earlier, by an attack on, on, on expertise. An open society is creating enormous amounts of cultural anxiety, a sense of almost a sense that open society is a contradiction in terms because a society has to have boundaries. Where are the boundaries here? Where are the boundaries in terms of culture? Where are the boundaries in terms of language? Where are the boundaries in terms of frontier? Um, I, I'm very struck by the, the sense of cultural anxiety that, sustain, that, that is alive across uh, Western democracies and is wrongly dismissed by experts and sophisticated people like us as if it's an anxiety that only they have. 
I think the anxiety is much more widely and generally shared. Um, one of the phenomena, again, that's taught everybody by surprise is that open society was premised on an idea of open markets. Free trade, international free trade, to a degree that's caught everybody by surprise, suddenly free trade is not working for broad swaths of democratic electorates. And this is producing uh, an extraordinarily turbulent uh, condition in which the founders of open society, people like Popper, people like Schumpeter, talked about the creative destruction of capitalism and now people feel only that the destruction is anything but um, creative. So the very defense of an open international economy has come into question as never before. One additional feature, I'm giving you nothing but the negative story. I Believe me, before I sit down, and I'll sit down a few, in a minute or two, uh, I'll, I, I hope I can end on a more positive note. When you put all these phenomena together, one of the things I noticed in, in, again, my brilliant political career is the ways in which across Western democracies we've replaced, perhaps less so in the Netherlands because you have coalition politics and a different electoral system, perhaps less in Germany, but in many other countries we've replaced a politics of adversaries with a politics of enemies. Adversary is a person you oppose today and you ally with tomorrow. An enemy is someone who wants to destroy you. We've created a politics of enemies. Um, American politics is a politics of enemies. People, you don't simply oppose them. They, stand, they oppose everything that you believe in and stand for, and they must be destroyed. That politics of enemies is tremendously destructive of democracy because one of the unstated premises of democracy is someone who loses an election today could win it the day after tomorrow. Um, and one of the geniuses of democracy is that it finds a way to handle loss as well as victory so that those who lose stay in the game in the hopes that they can win. And that dynamic is sustained by the logic of adversaries, not enemies. Uh, and we are creating a politics of enemies which is deeply destructive of the, of, the, uh, of the political fabric and also divisive and destructive of the social fabric as well. And one of the phenomenon of the, of the politics of enemies that is of the greatest concern is the ways in which um, a politics of enemies is what, doing what I would call confiscating the virtues. I now have a short political plug for my book called The Ordinary Virtues. Uh, normal service is now resumed, plug over. Um, the confiscation of virtue refers to something I think we've all seen from 2015 to 2017 in Europe. Spontaneous demonstrations of compassion, mercy, solidarity, and friendship in the in September 2015 by populations who, for example, flooded to railway stations to aid and assist refugees, has been replaced by a language of border closing and shutting off the frontier and shutting out strangers, which I don't think, I think the way to understand it is that it's a confiscation of generosity, compassion, and mercy by political language. If you live in the country I live in, it would be easy to think that Hungarians lack mercy, compassion, and generosity because the unrelenting discourse from the top is to show compassion, mercy, or solidarity to anybody who's not a Hungarian is a betrayal of being Hungarian. Generosity has been recoded as betrayal. This is what I mean by the confiscation of virtue. And it is fatal to a country. It is fatal to a country because it's ultimately corrosive of the generosity, compassion, and mercy necessary to the internal coition of a society. So all of this, virtual disinhibition, algorithmic segregation, the attack on expertise, 
the weakening support for open markets, the empowerment of a politics of enemies versus a politics of adversaries, culminating in the, cul the confiscation of the virtues. We're in a tough time, folks. I, I, I sometimes think kind of I've given you a kind of cold shower down your neck. I, it, it's not, I'm actually fiercely optimistic about the future of liberal democracy. You wouldn't know it from what I've said. But I actually think the only way to, to get to optimism is to look it squarely in the face and some of the problems. What do I conclude? And I really will conclude quickly. If you go back to the open society of 1945, one of the things you realize is how much Popper's vision of an open society depended on a strong sovereign state. It was not the open society of um, neoliberal uh, in openness. These were so open societies that were sovereign. Sovereignty requires strong states, capable states, states with tax capacity, states with the capacity to coerce, states with the capacity to collaborate with others. This is not a peon to Brexit, let me tell you. You can't be a strong state in the modern world unless you collaborate with others. I think the Netherlands has understood how, how their own sovereignty is integrally dependent on uh, uh, European integration. But a strong state is only a strong state to the degree that it creates equal starting conditions for all citizens for the sake of inclusion, for the sake of cohesion. But also strong states are states that control their borders. Again, a message from the perfect country, Canada. Our famous generosity and welcome for refugees and migrants is premised on border control. You can't have generosity for strangers unless you can tell your own citizens your borders are under control. That's how it works in the modern world. A strong state is the condition of compassion and generosity, not its reverse. Strong states in the modern world will have to control cyberspace for the existential reason that if they don't control cyberspace, they won't be able to preserve the integrity of their own democracy. I don't know how to do it, folks, but this seems to me an extremely urgent uh, public policy problem. Sa almost to last, strong states need strong citizens. People like you, participatory, demanding, informed, difficult, they show up at meetings on rainy Thursday nights. They demand accountability. They push states to perform. They don't sit out elections. They come and vote. The culture of civic engagement and participation is crucial to a strong state. People who think strong state means weak citizens don't understand. You only have strong states when you have strong citizens. And finally, almost my last word, strong states need strong institutions. Free media, free courts, free professions, free universities. One of the terrible discoveries of defending a free institution in a place like Hungary is the only way I can get leverage on the Hungarian government is from the outside, going to Washington, going to Berlin, going to Brussels, going to The Hague, because the domestic institutions have been decisively weakened by seven or eight years of single party majoritarian rule. Without strong institutions, you can't have strong states. It's not a contradiction to have a strong state and have a strong media, strong courts, strong countervailing institutions. This is, it seems to me, points us in the direction of a very different vision of open society in which open society is conditional on sovereignty, conditional on states with the capacity to enforce and defend the conditions of life for their citizens. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ignatieff, for an inspiring lecture, inspiring for the remaining part of the program, and I'm sure inspiring for drinks afterwards and the period ahead. Let me introduce Harun Shaikh to you, who will 
um, deliver our column. Now, I don't know exactly where you are. Yeah, please, welcome to the stage. And in the meantime, I'll introduce you. Um, perhaps well known already to many of us, um, director of the Freedom Lab, a think tank. You teach philosophy at the Free University. And of course, you're a columnist at NSC Handelsblatt, written a book, first in Dutch, and um, to be published soon as an English version, The Rise of the East. Thanks very much for joining us for your column. The floor is to you. Thank you. <laughs> Many years ago, as a young student, I read The Open Society and Its Enemies. And I have to admit, I found the book strange. Karl Popper's book appeared in 1945 as the Second World War was in its final act. And he didn't write about military mobilization, about the Great Depression or geopolitical rivalry. Instead, he wrote about ideas. In two volumes, he traced totalitarian movements to modes of thought in Hegel, Marx, and even Plato. At the time, this seemed to me like another philosopher exaggerating the relevance of his own field of expertise. But thinking about the current threats to the open society, there might be more to it than that. In our digital age, it is all about the battle of ideas. We now also face threats from closed societies abroad. These are, however, much less tangible than they were in the past. No foreign military provides us with an existential threat like in Popper's time. No powerful country adheres to an ideology of violent struggle. Yes, there's North Korea. It remains a closed society mobilized for war, and its nuclear threat is real. But it is a strange remnant of a black and white, wor black and white world that has come to pass. The real threat from foreign powers is much more subtle because it involves a battle of ideas, and this battle is tailored to our use of social media. Cyber armies and troll factories follow the principle of diversity, creating thousands of different profiles so that news always reaches someone like you. And they use the principle of stealth because they know we remember the first thing we hear about a subject. This is not the blatant propaganda of the 20th century. In its place has come a subtle influence fueled by shadow media companies and think tanks that present themselves as independent and professional institutions. <coughs> the threat from Islamic State is also much more in the realm of ideas. Its army is currently being defeated in the Middle East, but this will not end the organization. Its real power is in capturing the minds of Western youth, and they do not do this with religious piety. Booklets like Islam for Dummies and thousands of unread downloaded files about the Quran show it has little to do with a foreign religion. Instead, the digital caliphate has learned the skills of Hollywood, social media vloggers, and counterculture rap music, infusing the holy war with the adventurism of video games. But blaming the proliferation of radical ideas on foreign powers would be a mistake. All around us, we see how easily people can radicalize and close in the echo chambers of their filter bubbles. Ordinary citizens can suddenly turn into online lynch mobs. Western politicians use the online profiles made by Cambridge Analytica to spread populist ideology. When first asked whether Facebook influenced the outcome of the American election, Mark Zuckerberg dismissed this suggestion as crazy. That statement is, of course, dubious, because this company makes almost all of its money from the claim that it can help companies change the minds of people. But neither foreign nor domestic actors that promote radical beliefs are, in my view, the most formidable challenge to the open society. A more serious threat than radical belief is the gentle undermining caused by disbelief. 
Digital media have covered society with a thick mist of doubt. Conspiracy theories, fake news, and alternative facts surround our public sphere. More than fearing this will convince us of something, I fear it will make us cynical. The thick mist has transformed the mass media into a media mass where everything depends on perspective. Heroes become villains and villains can become heroes. Science becomes an opinion among others and its knowledge on climate change, child vaccination and nutrition is undermined by amateurs. Skepticism about our public institutions is the greatest threat to the open society. It is a subtle threat because if instead of attacking it from the outside, it, er it erodes the open society from the inside. And it is easy to imagine this situation getting worse. Behind me is an image of a software program that is trained with, the with voice samples and facial patterns of Barack Obama. This program can now make him say anything we want, indistinguishable from the real thing. This dangerous technology already exists, and more is on the horizon. The so-called Internet of Things promises to make our physical world smart. But it also means that we can graft our filter bubbles onto the physical world. Imagine real-life subtitles wherever we go, telling us to invade pe evade people or places that do not fit uh, with the beliefs we have. Our open society would then splinter into 17 million closed societies. As citizens get lost in the midst of the internet, we require a policy response, and I believe that that is possible. Let me end by giving a suggestion based on an analogy. Throughout history, new technologies like trains and cars have made us more mobile. This has opened up new spaces and also presented us with new dangers. This is what Professor Ignacev referred to this, as the openness that threatens to challenge democracy itself. But in the past, with specific policies, we managed to mitigate the dangers of these wild open spaces. Infrastructure critical for our safety, in time were regulated like utilities. Passports and license plates created accountability for the anonymous users. Speed limits and safety belts protected us against dangerous behavior. And for victims, we developed insurance. So my question is, can we come up with the digital equivalent of passports, speed limits, and safety belts? It seems the threats from the open society are very different than they were in Karl Popper's time. But now, perhaps even more than at that time, it is, th it is about thinking about and countering the ideas that undermine the open society. Thank you. Thanks, Hiram. And wonderful um, that you were willing to come and write and speak the column. Lydia, may I ask you to come to the floor? Ladies and gentlemen, Lydia Vlachsma, student <laughs> as that student at Radboud University, Nijmegen, for those of you who don't know, but Master International Relations. Um, you've been active for many, many years now as a competitive parliamentary debating or debater, uh, both at a national and international level. And um, just a quick glance behind the scenes. As said, we've invited uh, or asked all uh, vice chancellors of the different universities to nominate one student. They all had to write a letter. Uh, they all had to make a film in which they presented themselves and um, were asked to pose a question to Professor Ignacev, he doesn't know, but there are many questions there. And um, uh, subsequently, we formed a panel, a few colleagues and I and myself formed a panel that critically um, took position and you had to moderate us. And at, at the end of the full procedure, we chose Lydia. So 
he or she is going to moderate the panel and the floor is to you and you're to invite the other panel members as well. Sure, thank you very much. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, thank you, uh, my colleague Najib, for your very thought-provoking lecture. Uh, I would like to invite the other panelists to the floor so they can take their places already. Um, and in the meantime, I will explain what we will be doing uh, during this part of uh, the lecture. So, um, Lilian and uh, Marcia, can you maybe uh, take a seat? Great. I will uh, introduce you formally later on, but first, um, as I said, I will um, explain to you what the program will be. Um, as we've heard in both Michael Ignatieff's lecture, uh, as well as uh, in the column of Arun Shaikh, the battle of ideas or the public debate is crucial in an open society, and therefore it is also crucial that debate is part of this meeting. So therefore, uh, we have invited these uh, four panelists uh, to discuss open society in more detail and also to specifically apply it to the situation in the Netherlands, apply it to the specific threats that the Netherlands is facing currently and the institutions in the Netherlands that can help us to uh, avoid these threats or bend them into uh, positive developments. So what we will do in this discussion is uh, address four blocks uh, or themes uh, that have probably already been touched upon in, uh, in the lecture of Dr. Gnejev uh, and uh, the column of Harun Shaikh. Um, so the first block will be politics in the traditional sense, in the state sense, um, the Hague politics and international politics. Uh, the second block will be uh, the friends, new friends of open society, uh, so the institutions that can support it. And the third block will be the closest to home. Um, it will address community building and identity formation and how open society translates into that close to home um, program, process. But first, the panel members. So first, Michael Ignatiev, you have already met and listened to. Um, we're very happy to have you here in the panel as well as on the lecture, so welcome. Um, then secondly, Corinne Prince, you've already uh, met her as well. Um, she is here um, as, the, um, uh, as a representative of academia and science. Um, she's already mentioned that she's a professor in law and technology, a former dean of law school in Tilburg, and uh, is also in the advisory board of the NWO. So that is why she's here today. Then uh, to the left of her is Marcia Luyten. She is here to represent the media uh, as a supportive, um, uh, as a friend of open society. She has over 20 years of experience as a journalist. Um, most of you probably know her from Buitenhof. Um, and uh, she is also a best-selling author with her novel, Het Geluk van Limburg, um, which is about the decline of the mining industry in the south of the Netherlands. Um, yeah, so that is why you are here. And then finally, uh, there's Lilian Gonzalez. She is the former president of Amnesty International in the Netherlands um, and is currently uh, active. Um, well, she, she is active as a lawyer and a human rights activist in the Netherlands still. So we're very happy to uh, have all these panelists here to um, have a discussion. So give them a warm applause, please. So before starting the discussion, I would like to invite uh, the panelists to this podium to give an opening statement, um, or I will ask them an opening question to which they can respond. So I would first like to invite Lilian uh, to, give, uh, to give your opening statement. Thank you. Dear guests, open society, its old enemies and its new friends. Corinne Prince made a fantastic opening speech already, and there she mentioned that it's almost Sinterklaas, and I'm going to do the same. I'm not going to skip it, because 
it is something also personal. Uh, I'm also part of a minority. And every year when Sinterklaas is coming, there is around this a fierce discussion going on. That is fine. But for that reason, I also feel personally involved to share some ideas which are not personal with you. I'm also a lawyer. In a critical column in the Volkskrant of November 21st on the anti peat demonstrations last weekend, Sinan Sankaya concluded, resistance begins obviously in a bus. Is this reference to the resistance of Rosa Parks, a black lady who on December 1955 refused to give up her seat assigned to black people in the backside of the bus for a white person, not a bit exaggerated? Let's briefly consider not the Twitter and Facebook messages, but the facts. Three buses with about 120 activists from Amsterdam and Rotterdam were on their way to Dokkum, Friesland, to protest against the official arrival of Sinterklaas with Black Piet in Friesland. The demonstration was hampered by pro peat demonstrators who blocked the road and stopped the buses. A dangerous situation occurred. The police stopped the demonstration and the buses had to return immediately. The municipal government announced that the demonstration was called off for security reasons. One person who came on her own to Dockham to protest held a carton board with the text, a heritage of hate is nothing to celebrate. The police officer informed her that she did not have a permission of the mayor for a demonstration. This was, however, by definition, not a demonstration, but just an individual expression of freedom of speech. No permission was therefore required. This single lady was neither a threat to security. Conclusion from this incident is that the state did not protect anti-P demonstrators who acted in a lawful manner. Moreover, no pro p demonstrator has been arrested. Even if the government had a valid reason to cancel the demonstration for security reasons, disturbance of the public order is not a valid excuse for not arresting pro p demonstrators. They acted against the law and created a dangerous situation by blocking public roads and inciting a riot. And by not acting, the government may use concern about impartiality. In this difficult area of massive terrorist attacks, it is understandable that states take more and more preventive measures to control and minimize risks. However, governments should not curb demonstration and protest too easy in the name of public order. By doing that, they maintain the status quo, which mostly favors the position of those in power. Voices of minorities might get lost in this process. Open society should protect the right of individuals to peaceful demonstrations, to freedom of speech within the boundaries of the law. Protection, however, requires in the first place some basic knowledge of human rights and of the Constitution. One of the findings of the Staatskommissie Grondwet in 2010 was that knowledge of the constitutional order in the Netherlands is very limited. Therefore, the Commission recommended paying systematically more attention in education to the principles of the organization of the public administration the nature of democratic rule of law and knowledge of fundamental and human rights. This recommendation was not related to citizens only, but also explicitly to the government itself and its office holders. This includes police officers. Question is, 
what the role of the state should be in safeguarding fundamental rights in an open society. Is it only respecting and protecting them, or does it also pertain facilitating and enhancing them? With regard to freedom of speech and pluriformity of media, the Commission observed that the provision to protect pluriformity of information may lead a government to be actively involved in deciding which forms of pluriformity are admissible. That is, however, primarily a concern of civil society, for the citizens themselves to keep pluriformity of opinions and points of view alive. Taking into account the risk involved of an obligation for government to act with regard to freedom of expression, the Commission advised not to include the provision to protect, but to respect the pluriformity of media. In the end, the protection of the open society is a concern and obligation for civil society itself. This requires well-informed, critical citizens willing to protest and demonstrate to defend their fundamental rights and those of others. The seeds of illiberal democracy are sown in open societies in which the fundamental rights and freedoms of some are ignored or willfully neglected. Thank you very much for that opening statement. I would now like to turn to uh, Marcia Leute to ask her for her opening words uh, in response to the question, uh, we've all heard how important strong media are to protect an open society, but what are its current and most important threats? Thank you, Lydia. Yes, I've been asked to make a few remarks about media in this post-truth era. Um, I remember when I was... Um, uh, when I was doing my education as a journalist, I was at the Volkskrant, um, I was taught this really important thing, that there was a method to try to reach an agreement on facts. And um, this method, is, it's called adversarial, report, adversarial reporting. In Dutch, that is hoor en wederhoor. Um, it's so it means you've got to try to be even-handed, to hear all sides of, um, of uh, a conflict, um, and it also means something else. It also means that as a journalist, um, you are independent and you're always controlling those who are in power. Those are the two meanings of that adversarial reporting. Well, today I find it's, it's getting harder to reach a consensus on the facts. Um, and you also find that is also because not everybody now automatically adheres to the same rules of the game. So there are two problems here. One is the filter bubble that Professor, Professor Ignatia have also already mentioned. Um, and in that filter bubble, it's very hard to get to even-handed reporting that takes into account all the size. Another thing is that you see there's a diminishing respect of one of the founding pillars of our liberal democracy, and uh, that is the independent press. And you see that once this framework of the independent media and that method of adversarial reporting, once that framework is being rocked, um, then we are de delegitimizing the current order. We are putting the whole system at a risk. And of course, the best example, or the worst, if you like, of who's doing this is, of course, Donald Trump. It's so interesting because for him it goes that whatever is negative for the president, it's declared fake news. So he's always delegitimizing uh, independent press. It was rather funny, I thought, that there's this CNN anchor, he's called Jake Tapper, who was in the show directly addressing the president, teaching him on the fundamental pillars of uh, underlying the American democracy. Well, but that adversarial report, that was, my first, that was my first remark. Then another thing, of course, important in this post-truth era is the fake news. And we could already read that in, um, uh, we could read it also in the Volkskrant last week. They had this um, article saying how incredibly easy and at very little cost, um, this fake news is produced. And it's produced at commercial gain or to undermine uh, democracy. Well, the best or again worst example of this, I think it's Michael Gove in, um, in the whole Brexit discussion, 
where, um, where he was just like throwing with these claims that had actually no basis. He said, yeah, 350 million pounds per week are sent to the EU. And then there was this anchor Faisal Islam and he was challenging him on that. He said, dear sir, these figures are incorrect. But he insisted really, and he claimed that these, these figures came from the Office for National Statistics, where that whole office had never ever heard of these statistics. So that, was, that brings me to a very, very important question, a question that also Professor Ignatiev raised, how to manage cyberspace. I think we, we should seriously examine what can a state do to prevent ill-intended fake news to disrupt our democratic order? Can fake news, if it, if it is proven that it is spread with ill intent, can that become legally punishable? Yeah, and I can imagine that now lawyers are thinking like, oh my God, that sounds like censorship. It, uh, to me, it doesn't. I think we have to dare look for rules in a new game, in a new game of, of, of which we haven't set yet clear boundaries. We're now on a play field on which we are already behind. It's not about censorship, according to me. This is about 21st century warfare, soft warfare, and we need tools to defend ourselves. Maybe we need less tanks and other fierce combat devices, less than ICT experts, excellent prosecutors and good lawyers. That was the second remark. Then what makes these things worse is this fragmentation of our worldview. That's what Professor Ignatius referred to, talking about this algorithmic segregation. More and more, we lack a common point of reference on how we perceive the world around us. I think most media are broadcasting to and are writing for the like-minded. This political talk show that I'm, uh, I'm working with, I'm an anchor for, I think when we're honest, we hardly reach groups with significant different values and ideas. In the end, we often preach to the converted. And I must tell you that we do make efforts. We do make efforts to reach out and interview politicians or thinkers and writers, people from the populist right, for example. But whenever we do that, it's always, it never, it never turns out the way I would like it to turn out. It always ends out to be evaluated in terms of win or lose. It's always regarded as a battle between value systems. To give you an example, last year I interviewed a female politician from Leef by Rotterdam to Professor Ignatiev. That is a populist right local uh, political party. And we were preparing that interview and we decided that I should do that um, non-judgmental, non be inquisitive, um, be open, um, yeah, be curious to learn how she's looking at the world and the problems that we're facing. But seriously, I ended up being criticized by both sides watching. Because of course we gained a new audience for that because this lady had put, of course, on the social media that she would be a guest in our talk show. So we had quite a significant audience of uh, populist, uh, people of, uh, popular, of the populist right. But then it was fascinating because um, our regular audience I could tell on, from, from Twitter and from Facebook, our regular audience was wondering why I wasn't being more critical. And then the people that came from the other belief system, they were saying, oh, look at her. She's trying to nail her, but she fails. So I thought, okay, whatever you do, it's not, it's not good. How can we overcome this divide? I don't have the answer yet. Then my fourth remark, um, our open public debate, it's severely hampered by online, online aggression. It's what Professor Ignavia mentioned as virtual disinhibition. I thought it was a fantastic term. Um, I think most of you do visit Twitter sometimes. Well, um, maybe you've noticed that once um, uh, a populist politician is criticized, that immediately ignites an, an, an aggressive mob, an, an aggressive online mob is mobilized. And I've, I, I can tell that this aggression, it instills fear into people with other ideas, with more reasonable people maybe, and as a consequence, more progressive voices evade this negativeness and they withdraw from the public debate. Yeah, what, what um, Lilian Gonzalez just mentioned, um, this, this whole... Uh, 
this whole um, accident actually on the motorway last this weekend, uh, that was also an act of aggression. So there were these people who were lawful and had a permit to go and demonstrate in a Dokum, and they were stopped at the motorway with people, um, with, with the pro p demonstrators. And eventually I learned that the mayor of Dokum decided to send the anti p demonstrators home because she was fearing aggression by the pro p demonstrators. And I think this is something we should be really, really um, alert on, that the aggression that we're threatened with, that we withdraw from it and we, we try to take the exit rather than confronting it and defend fundamental rights. And then my, my, um, fifth, my fifth remark. And maybe that's an overarching problem. A huge problem with media, I think, is that news has become a commercial product. And as a commercial product, it can undermine democracy. I think it's especially this business model driven by clicks and likes and hypes and emotions that has brought Donald Trump to power and Brexit to Europe. And you see that our commercialized information environment, it really feeds on sort of uh, primitive needs. Huh? I mean, I think man, if, in the end, is, you know, he prefers sugar and fat to nuts and vegetables. So the same is with uh, the information you consume. Uh, you'd, rather have, you'd rather read something that is uh, emotional and that is a hype than uh, reading a very complex, um, a complex feature. And this, this also leads her to scandalizing news. And the major question is, can we leave the production of news, the production of facts, to the market? Or, is the question, is the production of facts a public good? And if we say yes, the production of facts, um, a production of truth is a public good, then might state interference be necessary? I do think there's a huge need for benchmarks that, um, that are trusted. I think Corinne Prince will, of course, say more about that, how experts now um, have to deal with, with, with distrust. So is the production of truth a public good? And shouldn't there be more public funding for something that is so awfully paid but so important for our democracy, and that is investigative journalism? So these were my remarks on, on this, to my idea, crucial institution uh, to our democracy, the media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia, for those remarks. Um, as a third um, opening remark um, uh, point, I would like to invite Corinne Prince to um, share with us a little bit on how uh, you experience diversity, which is often also a value associated with open society, and how you experienced the struggle that comes with diversity um, being the first female dean in your university in Tilburg, uh, and also maybe more in general, uh, what in in what happens at universities in academia. So I would like to invite you to the podium as well. Okay. Um, does this work? Yes. Uh, um, I didn't prepare yeah. an opening statement, and uh, this question is a bit of a surprise question. I'll uh, I'll relate to that, but I wanted to say a few things by way of an opening statement as an academic. Um, linking on to what Michael Ignatius said about his political life and experiences, um, that uh, many people shook hands, were very nice, uh, until they shook ha hands in um, an online uh, environment, and those were different hands than the ones uh, they usually shake in the uh, traditional old-fashioned world, and that has much to do with anonymity. And let me relate that to academia. Um, as universities, um, and broader than that, um, societal partners as well, uh, you might remember that we um, uh, initiated the so-called Nationale Wetenschapsagenda. Um, quite an effort um, uh, in order to uh, bring society and academia a bit closer to one another. Um, also, as part of a broader ambition of the universities to be a bit more in interaction with society. Um, uh, all those peer-reviewed international publications uh, read by uh, two, um, ten fellow academics are they as 
are they still relevant or should we as universities relate much more to society? Um, so, uh, the National Wetenschap Agenda, um, many, many different questions raised by society and brought onto the, onto the agenda of uh, academia. But since then, it has been silent. Um, and I still have the feeling that we as academia um, are still a bit anonymous for society. And it is easy to criticize academia and, and in that way, um, relate to one another, academia and society, in that virtual world. Because we do not see each other, we do not truly, truly understand each other, um, to anonymous. Um, so, linking between academia and society, trying to deal with the sentiment in society that it is just an opinion, it's not fact, it's just an opinion, has something to do with uh, the very fact that science is uh, too far, much too far away from society. And when we take up the challenge of interacting with society, we do that for a one-time moment, but then draw again behind the curtains and do not relate with society. Or not enough, at least that's, that's um, my impression. Um, nevertheless, I also see that there are challenges there, difficulties there, but um, much more openness, um, making ourselves understandable, making understandable why uh, we do research, um, but also open for debate, um, much more um, than we do that now. And the final thing is um, media as a business model uh, made me think of science as a business model. Uh, academia as a business model, uh, the way we are financed today as universities, the competition that we face, the competition, the ERC grants and the NVO application that we write as part of, you could say, a business model for universities. Um, so that in the end also relates, and that's my final remark, uh, with um, how society sees ac academia. So academia, um, no, I should finalize differently. Uh, of course, you can ask from society to uh, have m a bit more understanding for the knowledge of academia and that it is much more than just an opinion. But on the other hand, I think that there is a responsibility for academia itself as well to have society feel a bit different as a starting yeah. point. Thank you very much. Then final in this uh, opening round of, uh, of first remarks, I would like to ask Dr. Ignatiev, what did you think about the word cloud we saw? We saw values such as freedom, democracy, respect, tolerance, trust and debate. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned being an optimist, essentially, uh, com in, um, in respect to the open society. And apparently, uh, the audience is as well. Uh, as these words all have this positive connotation, but what exactly makes you an optimist regarding the open society? Uh, a great question, because my talk certainly didn't give you any encouragement at all. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I said it was a glass of cold water down everybody's neck, and I found myself thinking afterwards um, what the French call esprit d'escalier, all the things I should have said to leave, send you out into the <laughs> afternoon being optimistic. Um, the one thing I would, let me make a negative remark and a positive remark. Let me add to the negative remark by simply saying one of the things that uh, uh, Alexander Herzen, the great uh, Russian socialist, said something that Isaiah Berlin loved and I've always loved. He said, the thing we have to remember is that history has no libretto, that his history is not a song of freedom. History is just history. And, and that's important because I think there has been a kind of complacency about the future of liberal democracy. We're riding the wave of history. You know, um, the whole world is going to get to the Netherlands eventually, by which I mean everybody's going to imitate the Netherlands as a social model or Denmark or one of those great countries or heaven help us, they might even imitate Canada, although that's very difficult. If you're perfect, it's, you know, almost impossible. Um, and, and I just think that's not what's going to happen. 
the 21st century, there are many routes to the future. Uh, we cannot predict with confidence that um, Chinese state capitalism will fail. Um, history doesn't work that way. We simply don't know. It means that we have to defend our societies without the, assert without the certainty that history, we're riding a wave of history. That means we have to defend it more fiercely because we can lose it. Um, I, I think one of the things about um, being in Hungary, a country I love, I married a Hungarian, I must, I must like the place. Um, I, well, no, not necessarily, you're quite right. But I do like the place. Um, is that, that's something it teaches you. We bought in, I think Eastern Europeans bought into an idea of transition, which was a historical narrative. You start in a closed society, you end in an open society, hey presto, it's great. In fact, the transition goes on and on and on in very uncertain directions. But I think it's important for Western Europeans n not to write Hungary off, to write Poland off, to think the story is over. We just don't know how it's going to end. And it's, I think, important for European solidarity that we help those democratic voices in Hungary, in Poland, wherever, who are fighting. So that's the first point, is just, we could lose this, folks, so let's fight for it. History is not on our side, so that's kind of, you know, number one. Number two, and it relates to all the comments about media and also about universities, and here I am a rational optimist, and I think this is something that Popper is very helpful to think about. Facts are stubborn things. The climate is either heating up because of man-made emissions or it's not, right? A policy either works or it doesn't. You know, it, we can talk about post-truth forever, but eventually reality does make its choices, as it were. You either have a view of reality that, that illuminates and clarifies or you don't. You can't be, uh, the very good, our excellent column made the point about the mist, the mist. There is lots of mist out there. But certain things do turn out to be true because we falsify, we try stuff out and it doesn't work. We try policies, they don't work. We try pretending that climate change is not going to happen and then we discover certain facts that seem irresistible. And, and that leads me to think that we don't need to believe that liberal democracy is, is, is going to be in the mist or the fog forever. Certain things prove out to be true. And, and, and Donald Trump's flagrant attempt to deny certain facts eventually, in my view, gets punished politically. There are consequences for perverse, persistent denial of obvious realities, right? And, and to that degree, I'm a rational optimist because I think liberal democracies are full of the best educated people in the history of the world. That, I think, is historically true. This little machine contains the equivalent of the Library of Alexandria, and we all have one, right? We misuse them. We succumb to rubbish and nonsense. We're the best of them. But at the end of the day, certain things end up being true. And, and for that reason, I kind of feel when I get depressed myself, I say to myself, get a grip here. Reality is what it is. And reality teaches us unfallibly what ends up being true in politics. And I, having lost an election, can tell you reality is a great teacher. Right? And, and that's important. We're not, we're not in the mist forever, is what I'm saying. Eventually, truth right. will prevail. Yeah. Okay, with that, I would like to turn to our first theme block, which is politics in a traditional sense uh, on a state level. And I would like to ask um, Lillian, also tying into your earlier talk um, about human rights as a safeguarder for open society. Um, we have seen how companies and autocratic states, as Dr. Ignatieff has also pointed to, can manipulate uh, facts and manipulate um, our society. What does that do to our human rights to vote, to have privacy, and who should protect us in that? Is there a role for civil society, for example? First, I would like to follow up a 
bit on what Professor Ignatiev said, that he is um, optimistic. I'm not optimistic, but I'm hopeful. And <laughs> for that, I refer to Faklav Havel, who said that it's not hope, it's not that you're sure about the outcome, but that it's worth fighting for what you stand for. And that's why I believe in human rights. But of course, that's not easy. And I have some experience also with an illiber illiberal democracy, the country where I come from. And what it teaches is that you need patience and keep educating the rule of law. Because after the more than 30 years of dictatorship, the president is ruling the constitution that he put aside now to get himself out of jail. And what you see is that civil society little by little is moving on because there always has been education about the rule of law. But that education does not reach young people. And I feel we have shortcomings in how to use social media for our ends. And that is walking behind. And as a telecom regulator, I have some experience that things could be done, not about content, but getting in a more neutral way to educating. In this country, it's easy. And even here, there is limited uh, education in that field. But in an illiberal democracy, the government is not going to allow it. So it has to come from different paths. But it means having a strong civil society who really comes up for their rights. So a strong civil society and also education? Yes. Perhaps. Um, academia is maybe closest related to um, education, could also play a role there. I will hand you the microphone, Corinne. Could you maybe add to how education can protect these human rights, uh, especially in an age uh, where digital manipulation uh, by autocratic states or uh, large companies is on the rise? Okay, let me first, aside from digital uh, media, but let me first talk about education and educating human rights. Um, um, I had a, a pre-conversation with the Vice Chancellor of the Free University um, uh, in, uh, to prepare this panel, and he mentioned to me that the Free University <laughs> is a highly diverse university with a Vice Chancellor um, with a Hindu background a new uh, president of the university with a Jewish background, with a um, large student population with an Islamic background, um, uh, with m uh, more than 100 nationalities on campus, free university. Very much in contrast to my own university, Tilburg University, which is still uh, considerably uh, uh, white. Um, and still having an ambition to be more diverse, but it is truly a challenge also for university of being diverse. And that has to do with education, partly also with education. Um, um, in linking up indeed with young, the young generation, in talking about fundamental rights, about open society, I have the feeling that they recognize the values of an open society, that they recognize the values of fundamental rights, privacy, um, uh, freedom of speech, etc. Um, but I'd also do have the feeling that they would like to, um, they are looking for new words, uh, new words for traditional values. So, um, and a part of education is thus not only educate them from the classical perspective, using the traditional words um, where an open society stands for, where fundamental rights stands for, but also trying uh, in a conversation with the younger generation, in, in a conversation with a highly diverse student population from different backgrounds, different countries, different parts of the world, uh, talk about fundamental rights, um, about values and different and new words for values. So 
um, to end, I think that a discussion about an open society is also a language-related uh, challenge, um, mission. Um, and language is crucial for education. Lilian, you strongly seem to agree with the point just made by Corinne. Do you have any yes, ideas on I how agree. to develop this I put language? it in a bit of another way, that we do not use social media to reach them, but it's also a matter of language. Often people do not like the language of human rights. But if, if you talk about how to do things and not to do, and what is a good deed and what not. So what and specifically do understand. they not like? What specifically do they not like about that language? Perhaps it's a bit too academic. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Too difficult? Yeah. Would you agree? Difficult? Um, well, I wouldn't underestimate the language, but it belongs to other times. Yeah. We Marcia, think. you as a media expert, uh, of course, work with language and framing all day. That's your... Uh, the, the thing that, that you write is, is, of course, language. So how do you feel about this? What do you think should change in language in order to um, address younger people, younger generation? Oh, I find it really hard to, to say something about it. Um, what I was thinking is what came to my mind is um, that I always feel, you know, if we talk about human rights, it's about a thing that no, that no reasonable person can be against. But if you look at the, disc the, the global discussion and the framework to protect human rights, I always feel that that is um, a framework that was established after 45 and that it really needs um, to be renewed and rethought that, for example, if you look at the role of the United Nations, that, um, well, that is becoming a bit of an obsolete organization, if I'm allowed to say, not very effective. If you have Saudi Arabia um, presiding the Human Rights Commission of the United Nations, then you know that commission has lost. Then it has lost all its all its meaning, of course. So about language, yeah, of course, language is important. But I have not really, you know, um, studied the language considering human rights. But talking about human rights, I always feel that if we look at the challenges of today, um, yeah, we need we need a totally new approach of, of protecting human rights and not being only uh, on the morally good side. But you know, they're really. Dif difficult and um, uh, to us morally difficult um, uh, points where we have to dare and speak about, you know, about uh, migrants entering uh, Europe, then it's, you know, uh, yes, it is their human rights to, to enter Europe, but at the same time, do you protect the human rights of all Europeans by letting in too many people, which will really, in the end, um, frustrate the whole system. Anyway, I'm completely getting off route, am I not? It is the <laughs> contradiction between yeah. open borders uh, and open, uh, closed borders and open society that yeah. Michael Knejev pointed to, I think. Yeah. Um, perhaps to give an uh, example um, that you uh, might want to respond to, um, we see that in the, the refugee problem that you uh, also mentioned, that there is also this language struggle, right? In the Netherlands, they're often being framed as gelukzoekers, which means fortune seekers, uh, rather than refugees um, or migrants is often used more than, uh, than refugees, even if we're speaking about people fleeing for war and uh, prosecution. So, um, uh, Dr. Ignatiev, maybe you can uh, also say something about who is responsible for this language and how should we make it fitting to an open society? I think one of the reasons, one of the contrasts I'd like to draw is between the language of the gift and the language of rights. If you ask people who want generous asylum and refugee policies and generous migration policies, they think of it in the language of the gift. We're a rich, prosperous country, and we can afford to take some people in, and we can afford to give them the gift of, say, Canadian citizenship. And that language works much better than a language of rights which says, you out there have a rights claim on being a member of our society. This is where the, the, the language of rights run, runs into... This is one of the biggest challenges to open society. The biggest single challenge to open society, we're all painfully aware of it now, is 21st century migration. Mobility of capital looked pretty good after 1989. 
The Netherlands has profited greatly from the mobility of capital, but nobody really likes the infinite mobility of labor. And, and some people are refugees, clearly driven out by persecution, torture, war, and threats of violence. I think the international regimes that sustain those populations are still intact. I think if you asked ordinary Dutch citizens, should we provide refuge and do we have an obligation to provide refuge to someone who is in fear of violent death, torture, or is the subject of, 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 of a massacre or ethnic cleansing, the answer overwhelmingly, I, I think, still will be yes and will be yes across many countries. Um, the problem is what you're, what you're calling the fortune seekers, and there, um, the, the politics of migration depends on strengthening the language of the gift. That is, what works in Canada, to a limited degree, let's not go overboard here, is the idea that we can give the gift of Canadian citizenship and a path to integration uh, to a limited number of people at our discretion consistent with border control. And because we're, the, we're a very large country, we take in, you know, almost the equivalent of 1% of population a year, which is not... That's the other point I'd make. There's no one-size-fits-all here. There's no one open society model. What will work in Canada will not work here. What will work in the Netherlands will not work in Hungary. That's a feature of open society we need to understand to respect national differences, national cultures, and national particularities. But the only political way to sustain a 21st century migration policy is to speak the language of the gift, not the, the language of rights, on the one hand. And on the other hand, the other thing to say is that what the public will not stand is illegal migration. Because then you have a sense, we've lost control. That's a threat to open society. No political system can survive having a sense that the borders are out of control. So you have to reestablish control of your borders, and that then means something else which is difficult, which is if you find illegals in the country, they have to be repatriated. That's really tough politics, and it's very nasty politics, and it has a lot of human rights problems, which are enormous. But you can't maintain the integrity of, of a society without repatriation. On the one hand, on the other hand, you have to have a legal migration stream. You have to have, you've got to say to Nigerians, there are 160 Nigerians who arrived in Italy last year, you've got to say to Nigeria, there's a legal migration stream into Europe and it's this number of people. Everybody else who comes in illegally goes back home to Nigeria, right? This is the rough politics of this. Um, and, and the problem with some human rights discourse is that it, talks as if there, there's no politics to this. It's just human rights should trump, but it can't politically. You have to have a quid pro quo. Tough border control, legal repatriation, and a legal migration route. And if you put all that together, th there isn't any reason why you can't have a steady but m politically sustainable migration stream into Europe in the 21st century. But all of it is really tough politically. Yeah, I'm fearing that that will be the conclusion of this entire debate. Everything is so complex and so tough politically. <laughs> so thank you for your contribution. Um, because of time reasons, I would like to move to uh, maybe a slightly different topic, um, also already been pointed to uh, in, in the various uh, lectures and, and, um, and speak speakers, um, namely the role of experts. Uh, many of us in the audience here are experts in some field, in policy making, or um, the, the six people who are experts in the media, uh, according to the Mentimeter. Um, I would like to ask you, um, maybe specifically uh, Corinne Prince, how do you feel uh, as a scientist about the eroding role of, uh, of experts in our society because of the rise of alternative facts? And how can we gain trust again uh, as experts from our society? Um, I think I already uh, reflected a bit on this in that I think it's crucial um, to be open to a conversation. Um, that it's crucial to um, not too much uh, think from your own position in that 
the other party, this, uh, from the position of academia, um, why doesn't society understand academia's um, uh, academic freedom, um, etc.? Um, the biggest challenge is, I think, um, to have a true conversation. Um, a true conversation, um, not so much on uh, the agenda of science, um, but uh, partly on the agenda of science, but, but on um, making known how, how um, we relate to science, what science is, what the um, um, contribution of science is to all those difficult questions that we have here on the podium. You just concluded that I'm afraid that we have these many questions. Yes, we, we remain with lots of questions, and I see it as a challenge for society. For example, my, my, uh, I'm a professor of law and technology. Uh, you just referred to cyberspace, to um, uh, protection of cyberspace, protecting values, human rights in cyberspace, and on the other hand, um, sometimes closed borders in cyberspace. Um, I see my role as, as an academic in uh, academic, sound academic research to set certain steps, small steps there, but also not only to publish on all those results in the peer-reviewed international publications, but to have a debate with society, uh, inspire society to use our insights in taking it further. Um, companies taking it further in what cybersecurity exactly means in a company. Um, so I think it's a sound and solid academic uh, facts, insights, knowledge, little steps, but steps being set together with society in uh, discussing it with society and stepping a bit further together. Marcia, could a program such as Beitelhof maybe assist in that dialogue? Could you have a closer tie to academia? Well, let me first react a bit to what Corinne said, because what you say sounds, you know, sounds beautiful, but it's also very abstract. So I'm immediately wondering, what do you mean? So a um, uh, conversation with whom, about what exactly? I find it truly important to, uh, to give uh, lectures. For example, in Dutch, uh, for the Vrouwenvereniging van Goorle. I live in the southern part of the Netherlands. Um, I find that crucial, worthwhile, um, because it gives my audience of uh, 100 ladies in the southern part of the Netherlands a feeling what privacy is about. A feeling that privacy is something more than just a fundamental right in our constitution. And that may sound abstract, but during that presentation, I showed them, um, like Haron, like you just did, what that world is about. Uh, I make them, on the one hand, frightened, and on the other hand, offer them tools for their own unique position in that debate. I think that every individual can act in this debate, and that's the message I would like to bring down, and that makes it perhaps a bit less abstract. Marcia? No, once you start talking to 100 ladies in, of, a, of a women's circle, then, you know, that's the level where it's no longer abstract. And I think that's a great idea. I don't think there are many scientists who actually do that, but it's a great idea. And the same, I think, would go for about or for any other TV program. Um, I would think that we should stop being just, uh, just broadcasting and just, you know, sending out. And what is a beautiful concept, I think, is that you've got now a few television programs who have a program, and that's only like one thing, one element of a much broader platform. I always think that Bautenhof is such a strong brand. It still quite has, still has, enjoys quite a lot of trust. It could be a beautiful platform where you could find all the documents that we have used in preparing for these, for these, um, for the show. Because I can tell you, we work for like five days to, to make one hour of live television. And um, you could organize, of course, uh, all through the country, you could organize meetups where people can come and debate with a few of the guests or with one of the presenters. Um, but still, if you do this and you reach out and you get you know, out of the studio and become a platform, then still there remains this question that I just brought up, um, how to overcome this really serious divide between, say, us, 
you know, public TV station, and the people who are hostile to us, who feel that the public television um, is an enemy to them and is culturally against everything that's, that they stand for. And they do get their news from the internet. Sorry for interrupting, but do you think that, for example, the lecture uh, that Green Prince would give would be a step to involve people who would normally not be in, in the right bubble, so to say? Of course, yeah. Yeah, then you reach 100 people who might, you know, normally not be in your science bubble. But now I was talking about the about media, this, about my media bubble. This is, mm -hmm. of course, a different bubble. And, and how could we reach people that are not yet converted? Yeah, I, I don't have the answer yet because as I gave you that, that example of interviewing that politician from, the, from, from Rotterdam, where I was really very aware of, you know, uh, that we were considered to be, uh, that she, uh, she was considering me probably as her enemy mm -hmm. and how I could do that, being inquisitive and being really open. And it didn't work out. Livian or my colleague, if you are, um, Livian, you can go first. Do you share this experience of talking to someone who you know is maybe uh, feeling like an enemy towards you? Uh, is maybe in a different bubble and is fundamentally difficult to agree with. If you uh, work in amnesty with activists, yes, you know there are always enemies. Can you and share maybe an example of this? Let's find a good example. That's not so easy, but what you learn is that you have to start in closer cir circles to go first to the ones more nearby. I think when you go to the ladies in Horle, it's a bit nearby. And from there you spread further and that's what you try to do. I think this having en enemies and hostility is of every time, it's not from this time only. But by the way we have all the media, it spreads more fiercely. And that is harder to overcome. But it brings me to the next step that we talked about states and their obligations and civil society. But there is also this elephant in the room of the big media companies that have the power. And in the old human rights struggle, you knew what to do about states. And I have the feeling that this is the same. We don't know exactly how to get to this power circle of the big media companies that brought you to be optimistic but had some doubts. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, do you have any ideas maybe on this question? Well, I have one. I have two thoughts. One of the reasons people like experts is that they talk down to people. They talk about people. They condescend to people. Um, you know, and in the wake of the Brexit events, for example, there was this, and in the wake of the Trump election, there was this kind of astonished discovery that there were millions of people who were disaffected, angry, excluded, deserted by the modern industrial economy, and never spoken to or talked to or listened to. And so, you know, in its weird way, I do think that democracy ground out a shocking result in Brexit and in, and in Trump. Simply it made the experts, the elites, the media, the professors, I'm not, I'm not, I'm including myself, in kind of shocked realization they didn't understand their damn society at all, actually. They didn't understand anything about it. And that's one of the functions of democracy, to shock us into waking up to the realities that because of our bubbles, because of our because whatever, we don't tend to face. If you ask me why I'm, again, I think your distinction between hope and optimism is good. The reason I'm kind of hopeful but not optimistic, I'm going to slide, I'm going to line up with Havel here. That seems like the right team to be on. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful because this shock we've all had has been a shock about how little we understood and knew our societies. And, it, and it's humbling to so-called experts. I've been called an expert. I realize there's a hell of a lot I just don't have the faintest idea about. So it's a humility cure, which seems to me a good thing. That's kind of number one. 
Number two, I mean, the, the rule of the road that it's taken me a lifetime to learn, and I often break the rule, is talk about what you actually know something about. Part of the reason that experts get a bad name is that they start going off piste. You know, you know something about community, you know something about cyber law, law, technology, you know something about the media. Part of the problem if you're an expert is you start opining about every damn thing under the sun and make, and you look, you end up like looking like a fool, but you also end up making all experts look like fools. And then the public takes a tremendous revenge. So I guess the model is stick to what you know and shut up about everything else. And so, allow yourself occasionally to be surprised by these societies. So what I gather from, from all of your, um, your, your points is that there is this personal responsibility on an expert to go out and to approach people, to be, um, to be humil humilitative, what is that word? Humble, yeah, of course, humble. Um, to be humble about what you can do. Um, this also maybe translates to your book, the, the, uh, the virtues, the ordinary virtues, um, that individuals also have. So you would call being humble maybe a virtue. Um, what I would like to an end on is uh, to ask these other three panelists uh, what their virtue would be that is most crucial uh, when you are an expert in a particular field. And also to pose that as a question for you to take home. What is the most important virtue for you in your function as an expert in whatever field you are in? Um, so let's start with Lilian and then go to the others. Please use the microphone. Very, very personal. What virtue I would like to... What do you think is most important for an expert? What virtue is crucial when you're being an expert? If you want to think about it for a second, we can also... Because I'm not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me neither, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you are here still. Okay. You have um, a voice. I, I think you need... Uh, um, uh, humble, but also honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for all these contributions. Um, I would like to... Um, I'll just put this here. So again, thank you to all the panelists for their lovely contributions. And now to, um, to end this part, uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Ernst Thiersch Berlin, who is here uh, as a member of the VRR, and uh, he would like to conclude this, uh, this afternoon for you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that this is a quite difficult moment. Uh, Franz Brom, the director and secretary of the council, has asked me to conclude my um, concluding remarks at five o'clock. So I might have just one minute. I think uh, th that is impossible. That not, would not be fair, fair towards the uh, distinguished speaker, Michael Ignatieff, in the first place, and the panelists, distinguished panelists to whom we have listened. I will not try to give a summary of what has been uh, said, but I tried to listen together with you what, um, to what they said and to connect what we discussed, um, what was discussed this afternoon with the work of the Scientific Council for Government Policy, the DRR. Um, and, of course, uh, we have to be humble as well. Um, one remark about... Um, I agree very much with um, uh, Michael, and I have been in touch in the past uh, as well, and I think I'm quite familiar with his thoughts about human rights and virtues and so on. Uh, just one um, remark about um, the importance, and I agree with him uh, at that point as well, that it is good to... Um, uh, to, to um, invite people to view their contribution to welcoming um, refugees, to welcoming strangers as a gift. And at the same time, we have to be aware that we ourselves have received 
we people in living in this country in, in safety and security, a tremendous gift ourselves. And therefore it's important while we are giving gifts to those who are in need, not to humiliate them. And that is one of the, um, the points of progress that is noticed that we agree again, uh, that uh, we have seen in the realization, the gradual re realization of fundamental rights within our constitutional system. Um, assisting those who don't have um, uh, sufficient income, don't have a roof, protecting them, don't have the means to buy education and uh, other things themselves was a charity in the past, but now it's a right. Is that a universal right? That is one of the important questions that has been raised by, um, by Michael uh, here today and also in his publications. Is a human right something like a universal ethic? And is it just the application of these universal standards to everyone, everywhere, in every situation? And his answer is no, you can't um, put it that way because it is so important, and he stressed it this afternoon as well, to identify the specific situations within which people have to develop their plans of life to cope with difficult situations and so on. And uh, yes, indeed, um, situations are very much different. Now, one of the subjects that I have to teach at the university is uh, human rights law. And in my understanding, human rights law is not a universal ethic, but rather um, um, uh, a set of norms based on principles, based on the value of human dignity for everyone, that has to be realized in different situations according to the constitutions and the legal systems of that country. Therefore, it is uh, really important that in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, um, the margin of appreciation is a, fe a feature of the way in which they apply, identify, specify uh, the, uh, the, the norms of the human rights norms in the European Convention on uh, Fundamental Rights. And the same is true within the European Union as well. One of the points of critics um, um, raised recently, and we'll come back to that in a report to be presented by the, our council um, uh, uh, next year, uh, early next year, is that the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union may have emphasized too much the European, the shared European uh, standards and did not take into account uh, sufficiently the legitimate differences between these member states. But there are common standards as well, and they are very much related to the core subject of this afternoon, and that is the value of an open society. And an open society means that requires, I emphasize here again something that uh, was a part of what Michael Ignatieff said this is afternoon, requires a constitutional structure that is able to protect the openness, the quality of openness, the free exchange of views within that society. And that's the reason why we, it was um, addressed by the panelists, but also by Haroon in his uh, first uh, uh, comments, that requires that we don't accept a situation in which um, people are in, um, within our democratic constitutional system don't recognize anymore that in the end the constitutional system of a free society is a pattern of political and societal behavior that allows us that while we have different backgrounds, different convictions, different religions, different experience in real life, nevertheless come together and accept rules of behavior, policies that are binding for all of us. That is the, the, uh, the way in which uh, political, political discourse, and that's also where our contribution might come into political life, how we have to go hands and forth between generalized viewpoints and specific situations and experiences. And that is, um, in the end, uh, something that we have le learned from the past as well. Um, 
uh, several speakers this afternoon emphasized that in the bubbles, in situations where communication is reduced to crying into um, uh, uh, an echo chamber, that was an expression that Harun uh, used, um, that then we might see the other in the end as an enemy instead as, but it, as an adversary in political system. Well, we all know that that was the background, ideological background of what has happened in Europe as in the past um, as well. And what we see now in the so-called illiberal democracies, um, uh, including Hungary, Poland, that so far um, are developing into more intolerance. It's a view, it is a view that the others are enemies that have to be excluded from the chance to return to power or to be a partner in power. Well, that is something that I think is really important also in the practical sense. Understanding each other means to accept common standards, constitutional standards, including the way in which, for instance, in our constitution, fundamental rights are specified, which might be different from the way in which they are identified in other constitutions. Human rights require democratic politics. They don't replace it. And that means that there is a need, a real and serious need for people who are able to try to fulfill that role in the Scientific Council of Government Policy to translate into political relevance the insights that we can derive from real life in society from research, serious academic research. That requires patience, a virtue that has maybe not yet mentioned uh, this afternoon. Patient work, patient work, identifying insights, ideas, and like Corinne, I also appreciate to address not only audiences of colleagues, specialists, but also the Katholieke Frauengilde in Goorle, um, uh, and 10 days ago, uh, a group of young people with different religious backgrounds who found each other with um, shared interest for the value of compassion, interest for the other, interest for other ideas, uh, new outcomes of research. Well, at our level, we try to contribute that to politics in a way that will allow, hopefully, the government and parliament to include different viewpoints, to look around, to take for a moment also the view of the others, the 360 degrees approach, which is so beneficial for human resources departments, it is also beneficial for politics, for the way in which we assist politics. And I think that is a question of virtues as well. We have heard about different virtues this afternoon. Let me add one observation about virtues in the work of an ancient author, Aristotle. Um, for those who did not have um, a full education in history, Aristotle was in the fourth century before Christ, let's say the um, Michael Ignatieff of his time in Athens. <laughs> and he has written, he has written a lot about virtues, including virtues in politics. And one of the most interesting observations, in my view, in that part of Aristotle's work is that he, and I think it has often been overlooked, that he said, he said, in the end, the rulers and those who are ruled, the citizens, ought to have basically the same virtues. They have to be able to view things also from the side of a citizen if they are a ruler and from the side of a ruler if they are a citizen. Well, I think that is, without quoting Aristotle, what we try to do at the Scientific Council of Government Policy, fed by the insights of the people who are gathered here this afternoon. Thank you very much.
Well, Michael, that's quite a message to your wife t tomorrow. <laughs> um, but thank you very much, Michael Ignatieff. Thank you very much, Haron Shaikh. Thank you very much, panel members. Thank you very much, you all who've come to Diligencia and uh, shared with us the thoughts on the open society, old friends, old enemies. Um, and I promised you to um, use your phone once more so you can put it on, switch it on. Um, and by way of <laughs> thank you. Wow, this is wonderful. Um, what word comes up? That's by way of thank you, by way of farewell, by way of saying hope to see you next year at our annual VAR lecture. And to say prost for the drinks we've served in the room next to this hall. Thank you very much. <laughs>